since I don't want to give short shrift to this panel at all, and because we have a terrific group of people both up here uh, to talk about uh, this set of issues about the whole family, but also a lot of you out there who are doing important work in this area. Uh, I want to make sure we have as much time for that as possible. I'm going to urge everybody uh, to be uh, as brief as possible. Uh, and I'm going to immediately uh, go against my own advice here and show you a couple of PowerPoints, but it'll be very, very brief. Um, this is um, a uh, breakout session to try to dig in a little deeper on some of the issues that have come up very briefly so far, but we haven't had enough chance to discuss them. I just want to give you a little bit of context here very quickly. Uh, first of all, uh, I talked about this in the plenary. This is the issue that the American people have a belief in a meritocracy, and this is very different than the attitudes that you see in some other countries, but this belief system is, I believe, beginning uh, to erode. This is some, just some data on if you're uh, born into a less advantaged family versus a more advantaged one, and we simply uh, broke children into two groups, those born to mothers who have at least a high school education, who are married, and who are not poor, versus everybody else. 43% of children are born disadvantaged by that definition, and this is their probability of becoming middle class by middle age. Uh, a little over half, as opposed to 72% for everyone else. Now, I don't want to um, uh, pretend that the current inequalities and the level of poverty we have in this country don't matter. When the rungs of the ladder get very far apart because we have a lot of income inequality and a lot of poverty at the bottom, it becomes a lot harder uh, for people to climb the ladder. I was very interested having developed this metaphor myself and put it in my PowerPoint with help from, from colleagues. Uh, and by the way, my colleague, Carrie Granis, is right here. If any of you have materials or stories you want to share, please talk to her. Um, uh, that Time Magazine has now put this on their cover, this same kind of picture. So this is just the data, again, on uh, number of children born to advantaged versus disadvantaged uh, families. And then here's how they do at each stage of the life cycle. So, you know, they're behind, whether it's at, uh, in terms of being school ready, in terms of having achieved some basic skills and social core competencies at the end of elementary school, in terms of graduating from high school with a decent uh, set of grades and having stayed uh, out of trouble with the law and um, uh, having avoided teenage pregnancy and then follow, follow how many get a post-secondary degree. You can see there are these big splits all along the way. So we have this great panel here. Here they all are. I'm not going to waste a lot of time telling you about their very distinguished uh, backgrounds and they are truly uh, leaders of their respective organizations. I'll allow them to say more if they wish, and uh, you can read about their, uh, their bios. And I'm going to start right out with um, asking uh, some questions. And I think we should just start right uh, away, and uh, Kristen will start with you, um, with the question of if you had just uh, a few priorities that you could set for the nation in terms of how we improve the starting points for families and strengthen families so they will do better all the way through the life cycle, what would you do? And, and how would you coordinate it all? Because I think that's something you know a lot about. Well, so uh, thank you all for being here. And I am so conscious of the, the insight in this room. So uh, I think we're all going to try to keep our remarks brief not do a lot of inf intros. You can find out more about us and our organizations online, um, and then break this open for for your thoughts and ideas. You know, I think that um, the uh, we're here today because our 
uh, I think are you know, prevailing, certainly public poverty alleviation and economic opportunity creation system in this country is not working for the intended beneficiaries of it. And um, you know, I think that systems, although they result in, in services and actions are in fact um, premised on a set of principles. And that the, you know, one of the opportunities that we have at this moment where, let's face it, that every trend line that we in this room, whatever party or ideology we come from, but every trend line that people who care about opportunity care about is going in the wrong direction, whether it's about uh, you know, poverty, inequality, inequality along race, racial lines, uh, financial security. Um, and we've got where I live in Washington, you know, bipartisan super committee trying to figure out trillion plus dollar cuts to our federal budget, which let's face it, is gonna be cuts to a lot of our core safety net um, and anti-poverty programs. So this is, a really, this is a really challenging time, but the opportunity that we have, I think, is to reimagine and rethink how it is that our social services and social support system work for families. So I'd like to start the conversation off by talking some about core principles upon which a system should be built. And these are so straightforward and so simple, but I think we've really lost sight of them. Um, the first is that families matter and parents matter. And I think even as, uh, as Bell's research shows here, um, it, we, we are interconnected in a multi-generational way and I have been really dismayed over the last 12 years of, of being a part of LIFT's work um, and many of you have been a part of these efforts for much longer than that to see um, the profound divestment in programs that are supporting uh, parents, adults, caregivers, um, you know, the, the support structure around kids. Um, I'm thrilled about some of the progress that the educational reform movement in this country has made, but again, dismayed that too often our conversation is almost about how is it that we replace families? How is it that we replace adults through systems instead of actually supporting and bolstering them? I'm a new mom, and I sure as hell believe that I play an important role in my daughter's life. I imagine all the parents in this room would feel the same way, and yet, so often, all of Lyft's families, um, uh, or clients, or parents, and we'll go to funders who say, you know, oh, we only fund kids, or programs that are touching kids. And we say, well, you know, families don't operate in silos, they're connected. So we need a system that's looking multi-generationally. Similarly, like whole families matter, whole people matter. We've got a, a, a poverty alleviation system that has spread across over a dozen federal authorizing agencies that is uncoordinated, unharmonized, often benefits are working, counter one another, and it's still not even automated. Yet, I can log on to my Facebook page and have my college reunion, my next doctor's appointment, my uh, you know favorite artist's new album, and you name it, and then access to my PayPal account, which coordinates the entirety of my financial universe, in a matter of 30 seconds, tell me everything I need to know about my social, economic, and cultural universe. We have the knowledge in this society. Maybe it's in the private sector, but why aren't we applying that to public systems? Yes. Finally, treat, treatment matters. <laughs> Respect, dignity, and treating people as assets and not liabilities in our society. It is really a sad situation that in a lot of Lyft's offices, we're trying to help people avoid ever having to interface with government for fear of how badly they're gonna be treated in government offices. P yeah, over a long time, if you are treated as a sum total of your deficiencies, given poor or no choices, and told that you're not gonna be successful, that makes an impact. So we've gotta really rethink how we approach treatment, respect, and customer service. Thank you, uh, Kirsten. Um, Maurice, uh, what's your perspective on this? <laughs> I, hello, everybody. Um, so some of my background is, because I, I think it's relevant, is you know, I, had a, I came from a single mom, Mexican, poor family, ran social services for 22 years, and then, uh, came to really uh, feel critical about my own work and wondering if there was something different. And, and I think it, 
the, uh, what I went back to is that my mother was the one that really got me out. And so it really went back to, and you heard some of that in the stories you heard today, which is that, you know, your family, your parents, your cousins, I, I, you know, my, my nephew has a lot of problems and whatever, but family is, is really huge. The other thing was community is really huge. And that, um, uh, bringing it more to today, which is that uh, I do a lecture at UC Berkeley once a year, and there's this professor that's kind of watched my project evolve over time. And initially he was a little critical about what we were doing, uh, but eventually came to kind of summarize it. He, he basically said that right now there had been two approaches. One is, you know, more on, on one political spectrum that it should be bootstrap. People need to bootstrap, they need to do it on their own. There is no, you know, government should not be playing a role. And, and you heard some of that today, you know, it's that, that government regulations really get in the way. Uh, on the other side, uh, he said the other alternative has been that we design programs. There's theory of change, there's all of these different things, and, and that a lot of, quote, us and the nonprofit sector has been taking that kind of role. And in listening to kind of how my work with these, with, uh, directly with families have evolved over the 10 years, he said, well, maybe there is a third alternative, and it really has to do with where the power lies. And right now, the power has been either on the right or the left, and, and that what we haven't done is actually shifted the power back to the families we all say we want to help. And so what we've done in my work is really try to shift that power dynamic back to how way it used to be, which is that, again, you heard a lot of stories this morning of, um, you know, back in the old days there was community. You didn't, you didn't think of yourself as poor because there was that mutuality that people really worked off of. And, and entire communities, you could scale that because communities helped one another. And I can tell you, individualism, I think, is the death of America. You know, it really has to do with social networks and, and where you sit in those social networks. And so, you know, if, if you get it down to three things, I would say one is that we have to shift control back to the families themselves. You can't be holistic from an institutional or structured point of view. Every family is different. And the only person and the only set of people that know how to be holistic about their situation is the family themselves. So it has to center back control there. The other thing is choices. I, this is America. I mean, we want choices. As consumers, all of us are always looking for choices. And then if something isn't working for us, you know, we tell our friends and, and whatever. So a range of choices, you know, providing one child care center for a neighborhood and thinking that solves it, I wouldn't necessarily send my, my child to that. I needed a set of choices. And the last piece is what I kind of went back to, the issue of social networks, community, a sense of community, a sense of people. Opportunities lie within social networks, and most of us do work within social networks. If we need an attorney, if we want to know what the best restaurant is, and, and what Kirsten was saying is that the technology is there for it right now. And in my work for the, the families that we've worked with, they have a lot of opinions about all the work we've done over the last 40 years of the war on poverty. And I can tell you it's not that positive. You know, you're not going to get them to be voting and to be participating civically. You wonder why they don't. Is that if you basically tell them, it's, look, it, we've set up a system that if you get in trouble or your kid gets in trouble, then we'll help you. you know, and, and the story I'll end with is that, uh, well, there were, there were two interrelated stories. One is 1978, when I first came to the nonprofit sector, I had one training slot left for, two, for uh, a youth training program. Two kids came in. One had not gone on a robbery, right? The other one had, and he was being dragged in by his friend to try to get construction training, but I had one slot left, and because the way our system is set up on need, I gave the training slot to the kid that just came out of jail. And, you know, they looked at, you know, Richard then looked at Ben as like, see, you should have gone on that robbery with me. So that was 1978, and then recently I had a mom say, look at, my kid just got in trouble and so he got into this program. So he was given an opportunity to get a scholarship, he got a mentor and whatever. And she said, but I have this other kid, you know, that I really have really worked at trying to keep him out of trouble. And we don't have any of that for him because they don't have that opportunity. So we end up setting a set of perverse incentives if we don't have a benefit system that really accentuates the positive. I'm not saying we need to get rid of the safety net, we need that but we need to only have it in context of also positive reinforcement. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I'm gonna turn next to Patrick. Uh, Patrick is uh, the president of one of the largest uh, foundations in the country and they have done a huge amount of work in this area and support uh, probably many people uh, in this room. I know that we get some wonderful support from them ourselves. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna grovel here. <laughs> but, 
Uh, but seriously, Patrick, uh, as a philanthropist, you've had to think hard about how to strategically deploy your resources. What are your, what are your thoughts? What lessons have you learned? I'm tempted to say the uh, surest path to uh, uh, the American dream and opportunity is to become the president of a foundation. In the last uh, 18 months, I've gotten incredibly smart, uh, charming, and just darn good looking. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> one strategy. But turning to the, uh, the, the, the three priorities that uh, I would urge us to look at, they all fit within a frame of two generation, as was talked about a moment ago, that you gotta get kids on an early path to opportunity but simultaneously, you've got to reduce the odds that they're, uh, that they're going to grow up in poverty by helping their families achieve some economic success and stability today. So three strands that I'll talk about very briefly, family formation, family economic stability, and then building a path to educational success. On the first, um, and I'm sure that Rome will pick up some of these themes, but we've got to promote a healthy two-parent family formation and ensure that every child is a wanted child. That starts with... Uh, effective prevention uh, services to prevent teen pregnancy. That includes promoting the delayed initiation of uh, intercourse and easily available welcoming and, re uh, and effective reproductive health services uh, for those young people who have begun to have sex. Uh, apparently there's very little um, secondary virginity, as they say, and once uh, kids start having sex, go figure, they keep having sex, so making uh, good reproductive health services available is absolutely critical. Obviously, it goes along with comprehensive <coughs> sex education that deals with a full range from abstinence where you can promote that and uh, understanding the consequences of sexual behavior. It also includes, and I'll just mention, support for fathers to play a meaningful, healthy role in the lives of their children. I'm sure Roland will talk more, more about that or we'll ask for our money back. Uh, <laughs> and the second, second major strand uh, is to invest in the economic success and stability of parents and young kids. We talk a lot about the longer term things we have to do to invest in economic success. I'll talk about them a bit, but I want to start with the importance of a direct immediate assault on poverty as well as investing in the longer term past the opportunities. Keynes, we heard this morning the extent to which low income workers have been hit with the combination of technology, increased productivity, globalization. This all adds up to less availability of jobs at the uh, low end. We need the kind of safety net programs that reduce the odds that children in those families, and we're talking about literally millions of kids, poverty rate for children, by the way, is almost 22%, and for under age six, it's 25%. That's poverty rate. If it's twice the poverty rate, which I think we'd all agree is low income, it's 44% of kids are growing up in those circumstances. So we need the safety net programs. We gotta modernize the unemployment system. We gotta keep the, um, um, a food stamp program available, and we've got to think about things like supportive housing, et cetera. We also need to continue to provide the kinds of income supports that also motivate and reward work such as the EITC and the child tax credit. When we think about the longer range, we've got a couple adult basic education because so many of the folks who are at the lower end of the income scale need additional literacy and numeracy supports. We've got to couple that with skills training that provides a pipeline to real jobs that was mentioned earlier today. I could go on about work supports and childcare, et cetera. I won't because I'm getting the sign. Third uh, issue that we need to pay attention to, to invest heavily in prenatal to third grade interventions with, that have evidence of effectiveness in preparing, preparing kids to be on a sound path towards educational success. That includes the whole range from family-focused prenatal care, home visiting, early childhood, preschool and early elementary school investments, and scaling up those interventions that have the best uh, evidence of success. If we can have, if we do everything you need to do to have a child reading proficiently, not just reading, but reading proficiently by the end of third grade, they are usually on a path towards success. So if you think about it, it's not just about what happens once they enter elementary school. It's thinking about their whole developmental trajectory. Reading proficiently at the end of third grade is just a marker, but it's all the things that have to, help and have to happen around health, 
uh, uh, social development, behavioral development, being able to regulate oneself, et cetera. So I'll stop there and trust that Roland will pick up on the uh, uh, family, the, the fatherhood uh, piece of uh, my comments. Right. Won't you, Roland? I, I will. <laughs> my new job. Um, Delighted to be with you. Um, let me, I, I'm just going to start by just sort of telling a story. So imagine with me the tale of two fathers, okay? Two fathers. Father one, he's sitting uh, in his living room uh, watching his favorite sports program uh, with his favorite cold beverage. Upstairs, he has uh, two kids, a little boy that's eight, a little girl that's 10. So he's sitting there watching uh, this program, and all of a sudden he hears this big crash. So he gets up and he goes upstairs and he walks into the room and he sees that his whole bookshelf has been knocked over onto the floor. And he turns to his kids and he says, what happened? And his kids say to him, the bookshelf fell over. He says, okay, well let me help you clean that up. And he puts the bookshelf back up and he goes back downstairs. He's back watching his game again for a little bit. And then, guess what? Crash. He goes upstairs and he talks to his kids and he says, what happened? And his kids said, the bookshelf fell over. And he says, okay, let me help you with put bookshelf back together. And he goes back downstairs. That's father one. Here's father two. Same scenario. Here's the crash. He goes upstairs and he says, what happened? And his kids say, the bookshelf fell over. But he asks a second question. Why did it fall over? Why did the bookshelf fall over? Now, any of you who are parents understand the difference between and the importance of that second question. See, if you only ask the first question, you'll keep asking the first question over and over and over again. And you'll never actually get resolution. You'll just keep asking the question. It's the power of the second question. That's what's key. Now, when he asks that second question, here's the challenge for him. When he asks the second question, he knows that when he asks this question, he's going to realize that he doesn't have a maintenance issue that he's dealing with. There's something else. Because this little girl tells him, well, he called me fat. And, she, and the little boy says, well, she called me ugly. And then we started pushing each other, and we knocked the bookshelf over. Now, he realizes that he doesn't have a maintenance issue. The least of his concerns is his bookshelf. What he really has is a family issue, a relationship issue, an issue related to values, all kinds of things. And guess what he's not going to have an opportunity to do? Watch the rest of that game. <laughs> now, right? Now, I use that as a framework because I, I think that one of the challenges that we have on this whole notion of the whole family is that, that we live in a culture that, in my view, is very comfortable with the first question and not so comfortable with the second question. And I work for an organization that's a second question organization. And it's a challenge for us to get funding. That's what I love. I love this guy. If I, if I had, if I could have more children, they'd all be named Patrick. <laughs> Look just like him, right? Well, I shouldn't say that. That's <laughs> My wife probably has to say about that. They'd look like me, but they'd be named after him there. Clean that up. Is this video recorded? Anyway, but, but so we live in a culture that wants to ask just the first question. Because see, the first question's easy. I'll give you just a, a, a quick scenario that, that kind of uh, illustrates this point more. This is a true story. There's a little boy named Xavier. And Xavier um, is 16. Uh, he's now connected into the juvenile justice system. He's been in and out of foster care. Um, he's had a lot of issues connected with that. And, and Xavier's father was incarcerated when he was just a few weeks old. And his mother was murdered right in front of him. And it put his life down a certain path that can be a very difficult path. And now he's in the criminal justice system, the juvenile justice system. And people are asking that first question. What can we do to help Xavier so that he doesn't become a lifelong criminal? It's the first question. But I actually lied to you, because that's actually not what the scenario is for Xavier. See, Xavier actually is not 16. Xavier is eight. Everything else I said is exactly accurate. His father was incarcerated when he was, when he was a few weeks old. His mother was murdered in front of him. But what happened, something happened that changed his whole trajectory. His father, while he was incarcerated, became part of a course called Inside Out Dad, which is an evidence-based program that works in prisons. And if you want to watch the video about his father, whose name is Troy, you can go to our website and you can see it. But he was totally transformed by going through this program. 
totally transformed. See, someone asked the second question early on that enabled this program that could transform this guy's life to be there at that point when he needed it. Troy's been out of prison now for seven years. He's been raising Xavier. He has a job. He works in a funeral home preparing dead bodies. I had dinner with Troy just a couple of weeks ago. And it was a couple of things he said to me that were, were, were very important and, and illustrative. The first thing he said, that when he found out that Xavier's mother had been murdered, his first thought was to murder the guys who murdered her. That was his first thought. But the guy who was facilitating this program said something to him that just spoke right to his heart. And he said, what would be the best way to honor her? What do you think she'd want you to do? Kill the guys who killed her or love the boy that she loved? It totally transformed him. It's a second question. It's a second question. So my time is probably up, but that's a point I'd like to leave. I agree with everything that's been said on this panel. But I really think that the real challenge here is that we have to become a society that asks the second question, that uncomfortable second question. And we have to be funding organizations that answer second questions. We have to link intervention and prevention. We have to work on both sides, not either or. And we tend to work on one side, not both. And, and, and finally, we have to define the family as the whole family. See, the first question is, what can we do to strengthen the whole family? The second question is, who's the whole family? And, and typically, what has happened is that the whole family has been defined without a father. There's a missing rung on that ladder. So these little boys like Xavier have to reach extra hard to get to the next level because there's a rung that's missing. We know it, and we try to fill it up with some other thing. But the reality is every kid comes with enough rungs to help them get there. It's a father and a mother that can be with them. So that's all I can say. Thank you. Uh, thank you. I've heard a lot of wisdom up here. And uh, I want, though, though, to, because we have limited time and because so many of you, I think, are probably doing such interesting and important work, to bring you into the conversation now. So I'm going to call on people. And I'd like you to introduce yourself and tell us why you're here or what work you do when you're not here. Very briefly, please, so we can get as many people in as possible. You can ask a question if you want, or you can um, tell us what your role is in this whole uh, issue of creating more opportunity for those in America, especially the less advantaged. So um, a question in the very back there. Hi, Mark Tomizawa. We're building, uh, we're technologists working with university researchers in the humanities and the sciences with social workers, people on the ground. We're building an opportunity incubator that could be on every cell phone. And what it would simply do is match up the various strengths somebody has with the needs they have, the resources available, and it says, here's the window. Now, we do this to find a good restaurant, don't we? It's right, sort of a group right. on. So the idea is, what if we simply start to make this something that's available in America? Uh, I love it. It's all about the innovation that we talked about this morning. And I think, uh, Kirsten, you talked a little bit about you know, the need to think more, bold, more boldly and in, in more, more radical types of reform. And it's a great example. Uh, yes, right here. Hi, my name is Sarah Avello. I work at an organization called Advocates for Youth. We work on the sexual health and rights of young people. Um, and there were there are a couple of things that I, I wanted to bring up. I'm, I'm really glad the, the panel brought up the notion of the whole family. Um, and because I do think we function in this um, image of family meaning a nuclear family. And that is incredibly concerning because, you know, it is like being a single parent is okay. There are same-sex couples that are out there that, and you know, I, I was concerned, you know, reading through some of the policy document that I don't think it really reflected some of these whole family issues. So, for example, if we're talking about parents wanting to support their families, if a parent can be fired from their job for being gay, what does that mean in terms of their family stability? Um, the other thing that I, I did want to, to mention is that I'm really glad that Dr. Sahel brought up um, family planning, and I'm really glad that uh, Mr. McCarthy also brought up sex education, because we know, like, unfortunately, young people are not getting the information they need to make healthy, responsible decisions for themselves, whether that is to abstain, or if they decide to become sexually active, 
that they are ac accessing family planning services. And family planning until a few years ago was a very bipartisan idea. However, again, it is not in this document either. And so I'm concerned that, you know, have we shift, has, has a sense of what the right is shifted so far that we're leaving out the people on the ground that do support access to sex education, that do support access to family planning services, that are in same-sex couple relationships. Um, I think this is a really great space. There's a lot of great energy here, but um, I don't want us to have a missed opportunity in this opportunity space. I, I want to take the uh, privilege of the moderator here just to follow up briefly on that. We have done research at Brookings that shows that if we simply expanded eligibility for family planning under Medicaid to the states who haven't had the more liberal eligibility standards, we could save enough money for the American taxpayer uh, to pay for the entire Head Start program. And that's under very conservative assumptions about the savings. So, I mean, I not, certainly don't want to argue that the only reason to do that is just to save money. On the other hand, uh, it's a win-win. It uh, could help improve the lives of the families involved and the children who uh, are involved, but it could also uh, cost less than what we're spending now. and a very rough first draft. So I don't know if you aren't able to come to the coalition meeting tomorrow, we should get connected because there's gonna be an ongoing policy council, so um, it's not complete. Patrick, since you were the other person who brought up this issue, uh, do you wanna say anything more about it? I think the only thing that I would add, um, some of the work that we've done and or funded as a foundation has also demonstrated the importance of including parents and other adults in the community in this conversation, which is often left out because folks are concerned about adolescent reproductive health on one side of the aisle or the ideolog ideological spectrum. And we, I think we found ways to reassure that this is not about taking away the rights of the adolescent involved with a reproductive health decision, but at the same time, again, I think the research is clear that if you can get a parent ideally or another askable adult engaged where there's a relationship and that they have the right information in the community, then in fact we've, we've shown a reduction in teen pregnancy and STD uh, 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 infection uh, as a result uh, of that kind of approach. This is plain talk. Plain talk. Yes. Uh, back here um, on the aisle, yes. I hope this is appropriate and this is the appropriate room. I was trying to follow you as far as the whole family. Anyone can answer this. What is the American dream? I know that may sound like, what is she asking? According to what she's talking about, according to what everyone up there is talking about, and you all were in the room and I didn't get a chance to ask the question, I think it's still appropriate. What is the American dream? We're talking about whole families here. The American dream makes a difference to what we consider as important and important types of family. If no one wants to answer, please ask me for my email address. I would like to hear what you all have to say or read what you all have to say of what is the American dream because it makes a difference with that holistic approach for children and families. <laughs> I think that's defined by the family itself. I don't know that I can give you the definition for an American dream, and that's the whole issue. That's the transfer. The shift has to go back to the family. They have to find, I mean, I worked in Hawaii. The Hawaiian families looked at community and success very differently than other sets of cultures, and within even any culture, there's a whole difference, and so we need to accept. I think what I was hearing this morning, what you see in these stats, is really a loss of hope, you know, and that's more universal. In terms of what the American dream, I think it has to be self-defined by the families in their communities. But in terms of loss of hope and energy that they were talking about and optimism, that is being lost, you know, which reflects on, on the American dream. Roland, did you want to comment on yeah, that? Yeah, yeah, I, I, I did. I mean, I think I'd, I'd probably take the question a different way. I'd say, you know, I, I think that the issue is, you know, what's the American nightmare? And as opposed to the American dream. And I think part of what we want to do, so at least from my perspective in terms of making sure that you know, dads are connected uh, fully, you know, for, for the foreseeable forever. I mean, children are coming to the world because a man and a woman have sex. 
That's just the transaction. And the question is, what's, what's the relationship with a man, with a woman, before, during, and after sex? And what does that mean in terms of the context of their children? So my view is, my view is that you know, our strategy needs to make, be, be focused on making sure that, that that child that comes into the world you know, doesn't have an American nightmare where he's coming into a situation similar to the charts that, that kind of Bell put up there, where they're starting off in a situation that is a very traumatic situation. Uh, from the, from the beginning, and to my view, that's really where we need to focus. And I and I agree with with Maurice that it really is a family structure. But frankly, you know, it's like you know, people say we need to, you know, it, you know, there's you know, there's it takes a village to raise a child. But you know, in every village, there's a village idiot that everyone wants to keep their kids away from. So, <laughs> some, I mean, that's the reality. So somebody's got to be there. And I think my view is that what we're trying to avoid is the American nightmare by making sure the kids have the best chance to succeed uh, right from the start. Uh, right here. Wait for the microphone's coming, I think. I, I think so. Okay. I'm a preacher, so you know I can do I'm from Fox and Paris, Louisiana, which we call the end of the world. And what and, and Jill and Marie say is that we see it's about giving people hope. The problem is our people, our community is being labeled as disadvantaged. The very label that we give people cause problems for, for folk. And because I was raised in a rural community all my life. So when people call poverty, I didn't know what the word poverty meant until I got outside of black comparison. But so we have to start dealing with people in a holistic way and define them as human beings and get rid of all these labels as disadvantaged and that. So we do want to start on here for people. So we're saying is that the community has a responsibility. And one of the problems we find out after Katrina is everything that we own was totally destroyed. We find out that our government can spend billions of dollars overseas and can't do nothing on so how do you help people understand that as a family when you can help families see? So what our job was we've been doing for the last six years without any government help, we can't get foundation money because we can't how do you evaluate hope? I heard somebody say on the stage if it, it can't be measured or something can't be measured. Well we disagree with that that kind of thing. So the thing is that how we define some of that. So we're saying how do we give people hope but they can understand that in a family when people love each other, caring, when you talk to the family, I thought the kid was doing it getting his attention. But with the family, when we began to start making the family love each other, deal with the power of love and the power of faith within your own family, that would change. And that's all they get funded for. So we have to look at family, <laughs> define themselves spiritually and mentally. Once we get the people there, then sex don't go down, no things go down. So we have to redefine this whole lay stop the laboring that we do in this country for all these different institutions, and that's called the problem. Uh, thank you. Um, you want to comment on this, Maurice? <laughs> <laughs> so, so we, you know, I think everybody should talk with him. Because uh, we're working with the Mardi Gras Indian tribes and, and the social aid and pleasure clubs in New Orleans, and that whole sense of community, especially down south, it is still alive and vibrant, and we need to really honor that. And they said the same thing. None of the program stuff ever got down to them, right? So. It, for me, the, the biggest problem we're facing in trying to shift this, the control back to the families themselves is the stereotypes. And I can tell you they're coming from the right and the left. You know, so the whole thing, if you watch a daily show and whatever, there was the, the low-income families being called moochers, non-productive. At one point they were called parasites of animals and raccoons, and they're, they're the takers from society, right? And that was that. The other piece is when we say they're disadvantaged, they're uh, victims, they're, you know, all these excuses, it paints the same picture that somehow or other they're not capable. And in, in that sense, then, we disempower everybody. And you're right. I mean, the solutions to poverty are what, the way we run our lives. We don't have to have new theories of change. We've, we've seen it. We've seen how community forms. We've seen how they help each other. We need to go back in history and figure out what it was. And then you guys need to be funded. Uh, Kirsten wants to get back in on this uh, same topic, I think. So, so two thoughts. The, the first is that I think it is so important to name the fact that you know, at, as soon as we start talking about you know, low income or poor families, we start using a whole nother vocabulary, right, that we never ever apply to people in the middle and upper classes. I am not self-sufficient, nor is anyone here. I'm not independent, I'm not, you know, I, I, I can't tell you how much it takes for me to keep my own life together, but I, you know, I get praised and rewarded for the ways in which I ask for help or such, you know? So I think that it's very, very important for us to call ourselves on language because it matters. Secondly, I think, you know, 
we focus so much of our work in programs really on just treating people as, as if they're just about their one situation. So we're just looking at a, a kind of micro situation and trying to solve that where, you know, what, what we're trying to think about at Lyft too is what actually tethers someone to, to success. So if what will keep someone in a job or in stable housing, that's, that's not a situational matter. So much of that has to do with how they are feeling as a whole person, how confident they're feeling, how much sense of optimism and hope they have, how much sense of control and choice they feel they have, but it also has to do with how connected they're feeling to their own community and opportunities that they have to give back. So I think we've got to, again, move just from situational solutions to a whole person and, and whole community solutions. Thank you for that. Can I just follow up? Uh, I don't, well, there are some hands up there in the back, but um, I want to follow up with both of you, um, Kirsten and Maurice, uh, because what I'm hearing here is um, there are a lot of strengths within communities and social networks and in individuals that we're not recognizing and that we're not um, uh, heralding and celebrating and building on. Um, is there a role for state and, and federal policy, though, in this? And if so, what is it? It's huge. Now, I wouldn't separate state, federal policy, government policy from philanthropy and, and whatever, because you know what we're talking about is attitudes towards people. You know, there's another, and and that attitude is being set not just by government, right? So I'm on that president's council with Patty Stone Cipher and whatever, and we have these discussions. And they were like, "Well, what could the president do?" Well, the dilemma is that the, the on the council, everybody keeps going to a program, something we can do, right? As opposed to an attitude, which is what you're talking about. So I'm over there. No, what you need to do, you know. If I was talking to the president, what you need to do is really, you know, recognize these families that they do have strengths, that they can take initiative, they are capable. And the fact that 50% of the kids graduate in a neighborhood where the, they were scared of the police, they're scared of each other and whatever, you need to honor that 50% that's graduating. The solutions lie there, and that's where we need to start our funding instead of all these programs. You know, you need to, you need to kind of shift where the money and recognition goes. So what can government do? Some of it is recognition because right now they don't have money. I need to stop the leakage of all the cuts that are going in. In many ways, I think progressives have undercut their own message and we get attacked and cuts keep happening because we try to make everybody feel sorry for our families. You know, this is not, you know, you need to talk about how to invest in these families because they want to be invested in. They don't want charity. That's right. That's right. So, so, I mean, that's where government needs to change its policies from charity to invest. And I see sorry. Uh, I, I want to call on the uh, uh, woman on the aisle with the red vest. Hi. I hear what you're saying, and uh, I know we dance around a lot of things, uh, but I had the fortune this year of being the lead speaker for the YWCA's uh, beginning conversations about race. Racism is at the bottom of it. Nobody likes to talk about that, and it's okay. The other piece of it is nobody rises to low expectations. My question to you would be, how do we get the schools to understand that just because a child comes from whatever the circumstances are, that they don't want to achieve, therefore you expect little from them and you get little. Yes, go ahead, Roland. Yeah, I, again, I'm probably a broken record here, but you know, I, I think that these kinds of things start around the dinner table. I mean, and, and, and to me, it's sort of like, who's there? You know, I mean, you know, there's story after story after story of people who were told all kinds of things by the broader society. But when they came home, they were affirmed by people who cared about them and who loved them and who could be consistently there. So my, my view is that, that that's really where the hope and possibility is. You know, I, really, it, it really is, and that's why I kind of talked about the Inside Out Dad program. It's, it's, it's a program in the sense, but what it really did was it tapped into the assets that Troy already brought to the table, that he was using to do all kinds of other things. It tapped into that and helped him get the skills that he needed so that he can be the one that sits around the table in that neighborhood that he lives in with Xavier across from him and can give Xavier the hope and possibilities that he needs. And I think the key thing is that, you know, this is what happens at a dinner table in my view. You know, everybody gets a legacy. 
You know, it's almost like some type, it's like a hot potato. You get your legacy. It's all the stuff that happened from the, the past that your parents pass on to you. Whatever it is, it's yours. Now you have a question when you get that. You can either do something with it, make it better, and pass it on. Or you can, like a hot potato, just pass it on to your kids. Craziness came to me, I'm handing craziness to you, right? And so I think that really what, you, what, you, what we need to do is that when that happens, that's where that needs to happen. I mean, to me, teachers, yes, we need to do all that stuff, but ultimately, when you're affirmed by the people who love you most, it means the most. And I, I think it's a high calling to expect teachers to be able to do all that. I mean, it's just, it's just, it's just not. It, it, it's just, it, it, my view is we've got to equip and empower those parents in the communities give them to give the hope and possibility to their children. That's who spends the most time with them, for good or for ill. And to the, the more that we can do to change that dynamic, I believe that's really what makes a big difference in terms of kids long term. How do we change that? Uh, go ahead, Patrick. Well, I was just going to say that uh, one of the themes running through here, I think, which is an important one, is that you have multiple sectors here, uh, and no one sector is going to be able to get this. I think of the, when you think about how you do a crossword puzzle, I'm a terrible crossword puzzle person. My grandmother was a great crossword puzzle, but she always went to the stuff that she knew to begin with and filled that in. And then she'd cheat a little bit and ask somebody, if, you know, and, she, and she'd gradually fill. Well, the reality is each of us has an area of this crossword puzzle that we know a lot about. It's not e either or. I mean, I disagree with folks who say, well, it's all this. If we only did this, everything would be just peachy. I actually believe that we have the combination of the obligation of the faith community to stand up and hold all of us collectively accountable. We have the obligation of all the different ways we message to families uh, what the expectation of parents ought to be. We have the obligation of philanthropy that has flexible money and frankly less accountability and therefore we can be more nimble and less responsive to political ins and outs. We've got a different responsibility than government, but government has a huge responsibility. Uh, so I could go on and on and on, but I just, there's a theme emerging here. Just the only caution is to, to be careful how we phrase it so it doesn't sound like, well that's not really the problem over there. The real problem is over here. We're well, just talking about a different part of the crossword puzzle. Right? So it's not just all the downs, it's the crosses as well. So let's remember that this all has to come together. Uh, right here in the front row. Um, my name is Nicole Sarah, and I work for an organization called uh, oh, uh, Foster Skills. Uh, we're in Boston, and we work with foster youth. So um, you know, for me, I'm listening to this conversation, and, and we're dealing with the kids that don't have the families to begin with. They don't have the dinner table. So. Um, my, I'm not sure if it's a question, it's more of a comment, I guess, and it, it gets back to this idea of the definition of the whole family and the idea of, of raising expectations, uh, which is that uh, teachers, I think, are part of the whole family and, and maybe need to be considered part of the whole family because um, sometimes the traditional parts of the family just aren't there. So to, to kind of, um, I, I guess what I'm saying is that um, using a, a successful kind of family structure as a model from which government and teachers and, and educators can learn to support those children in the same ways. Sometimes children just don't have those resources at home to begin with. And, and, and regardless of how much kind of preemptive work you can do to ameliorate that going forward, there's always going to be kids that don't have a family. So um, I guess I'm just talking about the, the definition of the whole family and then asking maybe how do we begin to create a, a reference for those people that aren't traditional family members for, for how they're supposed to be uh, talking to these kids? So if the family is the one that's defining the American dream in each individual case, then maybe there is another definition of the American dream that, that other people can refer to as well, even when they're not traditional family structure. Yeah, go ahead, Maurice. I know we're out of time. But, um, so, you know, the thing is, uh, don't separate family from community. Yeah, yeah. You know, as soon as you do that, then you run into that problem. Because almost everybody has a friend, more than a teacher. I mean, a teacher may be there for a little bit, but a friend, you know, the whole issue is about the trusting relationships, about a real relationship, personal relationships, and almost everybody does build, except for Kaczynski. But, you know, everybody else really builds sense of friendships, and that, that's what you really need to count on, you need to reinforce. So, I think, and, and you know, on the foster stuff, they are doing more uh, research online about extended families and whatever, uncles, I mean, 
you know, that kind of stuff. So I do think that the extended family has to include your friends where there's a personal relationship. I'll take uh, one last question, and um, it's going to be from my friend in the green sweater there because I know she's interested in parenting, and I think we haven't talked enough about that. Uh, yes, my name is Cheryl Vines. I'm from the Family <coughs> Center and the Parenting Journey Institute. And as I was hearing you talking about the children in foster care, for the past 23 years of my life, I've worked a lot with parents, birth parents of those kids in foster care. And I would say in many cases, those parents, they didn't drop away from the earth. In many cases, they were decided that they weren't worthy and they weren't supported. And the kids were pulled away. Now, I'm not saying that all of those parents, for whatever reasons in their life conditions, have left them with what they need to be able to sometimes successfully raise their kids. But I don't think we've invested in them in the right way. And I think this is about the whole family. And you're hearing more and more if you're working with foster children, you know that a lot of those children themselves also end up with children who are in care. So we have to figure out how to break the cycle and break the chain. And I think it starts with working with the parents who are already in those households that, you know, when I ask parents, you know, how many of you had to dream when you had your child? to have the state take them away and have you say, you're a bad parent. Not one person raises their hands. And then I ask them, how many of you love your kids? They all raise their hands. And then I say, how many of you have hope that you can actually get your kids back and be able to be a happy and productive family? Hands tentatively go up, but ultimately they don't. That's what I think we have to restore, that sense of hope and possibility so that we can give parents what they need in order to raise their kids. Because at the end of the day, with all these programs, kids go home to their families. And they can either support them or destroy them. And I say, let's help them support them. Thank you. Um, I'm going to now, uh, we're, we're running out of time. Um, I'm going to ask uh, each of the panelists up here to have um, a final word. Uh, it must be brief, uh, under one minute, and I'm going to interrupt you if you don't stick to that rule. So um, let's start at the other end of the uh, table. Uh, if you're ready, Roland, you're always ready, right? Got, gotcha. Word. <laughs> you can cede your time. Yeah, I can see the time. Yeah, you I can cede your time to Patrick, and maybe he'll give you more money. Yeah. <laughs> now that's a thought. That's an incredible thought. Thank you very much, for that. Um, well, I, I would just, you know, kind of end where I began, which is, you know, this whole notion of, you know, obviously the importance of, you know, focusing on asking those, those difficult questions, the second questions, being focused on funding that. And uh, again, as, you know, as I've said earlier, that, you know, that can be a challenge because you don't see the results as quick. It doesn't make you feel as good. But ultimately, when you ask those second questions, that's what gets, gets you um, further to solution. The last thing I would say, just to springboard off of uh, what the, the, the young lady said there in the green about, about these families, uh, this is the same thing I see just in the subset of fathers. You know, there's this inspiration that people have when they become parents. And there's, there's, it's, the question is, how do you move them from inspiration to action? And not just any action, but confident action. Well, the way you move people from inspiration to confident action is that you tap into the assets that they already have and you give them the skills that they need to get there. That's what happens to every parent. You've got an inspiration when that child is born, well, then what do you do then? Well, you get skills, you get motivation, it comes from, it comes from that. So that's what my view is that you need to do. You move from inspiration to action, and more that we can do in that regard, a lot of the other issues that we're talking about, in my view, become less of an issue because we focused on those two people that brought the kid into the world to begin with. Thanks. Patrick. So, um, <laughs> You know, we've talked a lot, I think, so far today about kind of policy changes and things that we need to see. The thing that I'd like to add to what we've all said already is that uh, if I had a bumper sticker on my car, it would read that bad programs trump good policy and bad systems trump good programs, right? So what I mean by that is we don't know everything. We don't have all the effective interventions we ought to have, whatever they may be. We don't know enough, but we know a heck of a lot more than what we use, in fact. We waste much too much time and money and attention on programs that all the evidence suggests 
don't work. I can tell you what I think they are, but that's another seminar. <laughs> At the same time, we've seen time and time and time again where interventions, whether they're programs or other kinds of interventions that actually work rather well, are unable to be scaled up to a level where they make a difference for a whole population mm -hmm. as opposed to the lucky few who happen to come into that program. So scale and sustainability and why do we end up seeing these things wither on the vine and not have the impact they ought to is because of the way systems are structured. They're, they're not often structured in a way that has the financing aligned with the outcomes you want to get, that have the information systems that you need, has the workforce has the right approach to engaging families, not only in a respectful way, but in a way that empowers them to take control of their own lives, that makes decisions in the right way, and that you get the del delivery processes right. Those kinds of system problems will trump the best program, chew it up, and spit it out the other way so it's unrecognizable from what the original idea was. So uh, I, I think I'll stand on that as a last word. So instead of a story, uh, my point is that um, really the only difference between those in this room and, and low-income families are that they have less money, you know? And so the issue to me then is like, we'll get money to them. I mean, and that's what we have. We have money, obviously, we have a lot of programs and advice too, but really what they need is they need our money, you know? And they need our social networks that have opportunities. So I'd say those connections are really important. So I would take a lot of this money we give to the 1% and then a lot of the money that we give to ourselves to go to conferences like this and give it to the money, to the families. We have mechanisms. I mean, there's mechanisms that we are ex experimenting with to get money to families based on their strengths. Instead of all this need stuff, we need to find out what their strengths are and then invest in that. So to me, there is a transfer of both social networks and a transfer of money that really needs to happen. That's when we've seen results out of these families. So two last thoughts. First, to the woman in the red, uh, thank you for naming race as a huge issue. We, should, you know, we could have spent the whole panel talking about that, and we probably should, uh, as well as structurally low standards that are baked into systems. So I want to just acknowledge those. Um, and to the question about the American dream, I guess I'll say that my, my thoughts on that are that the circumstances of your birth, a matter of sheer chance and luck, um, shouldn't in any way inhibit your potential um, to pursue your dreams and, and you know, achieve your full potential. I mean, I think that's, that's what Elaine Chow and others were talking about, but that's just not, that's not the story in America right now. It's just not, so we gotta get back to that. Uh, well, I want to thank all of you for being here, uh, for caring about opportunity, however you define it, for caring about the whole family, however you define it. And I especially want to thank uh, the people up here who shared their ideas and their time with us. Let's give them a final.